Friends, uh, we'd like to welcome you to the commemoration of the uh, brutal murders of thousands of political prisoners in Iran 22 years ago, in 1988. Arbitrary arrests, imprisonment, torture, and executions are Iranian Republic's main tools to stay in power. And although we all know that the fall of this regime is the solution to the Iranian situation, we ask all freedom-loving people of the world to pressure the Iranian theocracy by demanding the release of the political prisoners in Iran. As we speak, several political prisoners are waiting death in the Middle Ages dungeons of the Islamic Republic including 16 people in the Kurdistan province. Today's program consists of two sections, English section and the Persian section. I will be conducting the English section. And in this section, we will have uh, Ms. Marie Clark Walker, the uh, Executive Vice President of the Canadian Labor Congress, we also have Mr. Tariq Fatah, whom I know personally, good friend, social activist and writer. We are also hoping that uh, Mr. Muridi, the member of provincial parliament, will be also on hand to uh, talk to us. This program is organized by Khabaran Organization, the Organization for the Defense of Political Prisoners of Iran, who has been uh, doing this tremendous job for 15 years. Also by RDFI, the Rights and Democracy and Freedom for Iran group in Toronto, the Federation of Iranian Refugees and Immigrants, the Committee for Release of Political Prisoners, Toronto Branch, the Committee for Solidarity with the Mourning Mothers in Iran, and finally by NEDA for Peace and Freedom. This program is also sponsored by Sharvan Newspaper, whom we'd like to thank. Just two points of order. Could you please turn your cell phones off or put them on the vibrator? And also, I've been asked to tell you not to photograph the audience. Having said that, thank you very much one more time for attending. And I would like to uh, invite uh, Marie to the podium. Marie, thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, want to bring greetings, first of all, and solidarity from my colleagues, President Ken Giorgetti, Secretary Treasurer Hassan Youssef, and the other Executive Vice President, Sister Barb Byers. I also want to bring greetings from our 3.2 million members who stand beside you every single day through the trials and tribulations that you face. Let me also thank the organizing committee as well as a particular staff person, Mehdi, who is in the audience, who is Iranian himself and makes sure that all of us are kept apprised of everything that happens in Iran, both with the government and the trade union movement. I'm very honored to have been invited to share my thoughts with you today on this very sad occasion. However, while sad, it's also an occasion that I think should never be forgotten. 22 years ago, many of your colleagues were murdered simply for their political and religious beliefs. This, by any stretch of the imagination, is wrong. We know that in spite of pressure from human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, and so many other Iranian other and so many others, sorry, the Iranian government has never officially acknowledged the executions. The majority of those executed were serving prison sentences for their political activities after unfair trials in revolutionary courts. They had, however, never been sentenced to death. Every day in this country, many of us go to work. We work for trade unions, we have political affiliations, we attend different faith-based institutions. Can you imagine just being killed just because of your belief, your political affiliation, 
your political stripe, any of those things were different from the leadership of this country. This is the fear that hundreds of thousands of people in many countries face every single day. This is what became a reality for thousands of Iranians in 1988. And I'm sure there are many people in this room that can testify in vivid detail to their experiences before the death commission. The commission was charged with interrogating prisoners about their political and religious beliefs in order to establish whether they were apostates. And when you read the accounts of what happened, it doesn't really matter which side has written the account. All of the accounts are quite clear that men and women were murdered and there was an effort to both hide the executions or to make others believe that those executed were the worst of the worst. In fact, many were students who were protesting the behavior of the government of the day and insisting on human rights for all. In the eyes of those who were affected, the United Nations stood by and did very little to stop the mass killings, even though it was very, very clear that Iran was in violation of Article 14 of the International Covenant of Civil Rights and Political Rights. It was clear that the murders were to silence their critics, and it was very clear that the tactic had the desired effect by instilling fear into those who wanted to speak out. After all, the worst fears were coming to light right in front of them. Men were being killed because they were not the correct religion or political stripe. People were first forced to de denounce religions that were not acceptable to the regime or risk murder. murder. Women were treated the same, lashed and killed. And while many know this was happening, there was little appetite to do anything. The government became really good at spinning stories, saying that people, mostly women, were committing suicide. How did they come to that conclusion? Well, their refusal to, re re to not embrace, sorry, their refusal to embrace Islam was the reason for death, and therefore it was their own fault. Therefore, in their eyes, they were committing suicide. Unfortunately, even today, we're still receiving bad news of executions, stonings, torture, arbitrary arrests, and detentions of prisoners of conscience. There is lack of equality under the law. There's legal discrimination against women, violations of due process, ethnic and religious discrimination, violations of freedom of expression, media censorship, and crackdown on civil rights, and as well, violations in the area of freedom of association and assembly. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, it's time, well past time for the truth to come out. It's time for the families of the victims to have closure. It's time for the people of Iran to know where the bodies of their loved ones are. Let us stand together in supporting a call for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Yes, the truth needs to come out, but the country also needs to reconcile what the past has done and find ways to give closure to all of those who, are, who have been affected. And we know that it's possible to do because it has been done before. South Africa and Liberia are just two examples of countries where it has been done. Sisters and brothers, your work thus far has not been in vain. You have the support of the Canadian labor movement. You have the support both of the national uh, staff and officers in the Canadian labor movement, as well as our international brothers and sisters in the labor movement. That support is there for you to help you find the truth for the families and friends of all the victims. We should not let such a crime of humanity ever, ever happen again in Iran or any other country. Thank you. Thank you, Marie, and uh, I would like to help you invite uh, Tarek. Tarek, would you come to the podium, please? Thank you very much. Salam, uh, and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, for such a sad occasion. But uh, unfortunately, what happened 22 years ago uh, should have been a wake-up call for people around the world because I do not see this simply as an Iranian tragedy or a tragedy of the Iranian people or the Kurdish people. This killing, mass killing, 
was a natural extension of what Islamism is all about. And if from this tragedy we cannot understand, after 20 years, the tentacles of world Islamism and the jihadi movement, and isolate it only about the issues of uh, the murders taking place 22 years ago, then we will commit the same mistakes that we have done, which have allowed this horrible dictatorship of theocracy not just to strangle the people and the spirits of uh, the Iranian uh, community, but has been able to spread itself right here to the university campuses of Toronto and Columbia and LA, UCLA and worldwide. Today, what Ayatollah Khomeini started has spread to the far corners of the earth, whether it is uh, the terrorism that blows up synagogues in Argentina, or whether it is almost a dozen people who are killed every day in Pakistan, or the intimidation that young women face in the university campuses of Toronto where they either have to cover their heads or to be considered uh, good Muslims. The aspects of Islamism in its various forms are spreading. And when there are 5,000 people who are massacred by the Ayatollahs, you have to understand that half a million are massacred in Darfur by the same ideology. If you cannot make these connections, brothers and sisters, we will be left isolated. You have to understand that the Islamist dictatorship in Iran is working hand in hand with the Islamist dictatorship of Saudi Arabia. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt and the Jamaat Islami of Pakistan are working together for the Islamization of Turkey today. It is not a coincidence that just yesterday the Iranian government offered 20 million dollars to the new Turkish uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the Turkish government to enact new democratic laws in Turkey. How ridiculous it is that a dictatorship like Iran would be introducing, giving money to introduce democracy in Turkey. So unless and until we identify the bigger uh, uh, issue that faces us, we will not be able to fight back. If you're talking 1988 when these massacres took place, you need to go back and say 1971 when one million Bangladeshis were killed in a genocide by the Pakistan army in the name of Islam. If that didn't wake you up, that is the reason why well, the forces of world Islamism are united and the forces of enlightenment and secularism and left-wing activism and Marxism are totally divided in so many parts that our enemies, the enemies of human civilization, are having a laugh. Today we have a situation that Islamists are not just present in lower levels of power. You have Muslim Brotherhood folks in the White House who determine the speeches of President Obama. And most of us are oblivious to those facts. If there are peeping, people being killed in the same ideology under which the Kurds were massacred in Iran, or the Baloch were mur murdered in Sistan, or the Azeris were massacred, or the Iranian people just last year were shot dead on the streets of Toronto. You have to figure out what is the force that we have to fight and what are the tools available to us to stand up to them. And unless the left recognizes that Islamism is not our ally, we will be making the same mistakes that the two they made in 1979 and suffered immensely. We need to broaden our horizons and understand this, what is at stake here. That today, if Ataturk's Turkey is becoming the Jamaat Islami's uh, Pakistan, and Iran, instead of moving uh, towards a democracy, is further entrenching the rule of the Ayatollahs, we have a catastrophe at our hand. And we need to make those alliances where we understand how to make sure that secularism, the separation of religion and state, the notion of working class people being enlightened and led not by the Islamists but by progressive forces, we will have another such massacre. Because if this happened in 1988 and just two years ago half a million Darfuris got massacred and we didn't act, then I can assure you brothers and sisters this will happen in Toronto one of these days. We are not far away from the people whose only objective in life is a worldwide jihad. 
and the notion of a caliphate which is governed through from Qum and Mecca that makes sure that women become second class citizens, that gays and lesbians are killed, where racism that makes blacks not human are enacted into legislation. We need to understand that when people get massacred in the holy city of Mecca, then there would be no problem to massacre them in Tehran. Those are the forces that are aligned against us. As much as I, my heart goes out to the Iranian people for what they have suffered for the last 30 years, I am telling you that more is at stake unless the same Iranian people take leadership and enlightenment and say to the rest of the world, we've seen the effects of Islamism and it is a challenge and an attack on human civilization, not Western civilization. This is an attack on Saadi, this is an attack on poetry, this is an attack on women, this is an attack on gays and lesbians and working class people suffered the most. Today we have people on the left who are, are trying to justify what is Mahmoud Ahmadinejad is doing in Iran in the name of anti-imperialism. We need to be very clear that people who have theocracy on their mind are not the allies of anti-imperialism. Anti-imperialism is not the right of Mullah to dictate to us. And Lenin said a very important thing in 1924 in Tashkent. And he said, never let the anti-Western feelings of the Mullah or the Khan confuse you that the Mullah is anti-imperialist. Because that Mullah is anti-imperialist only because he hates progress. We are not against progress. We are for progress. Rousseau and Voltaire and Karl Marx are part of us. They are not European. We are human beings. We are on the left and we want to take back enlightenment, democracy, women's rights, gay rights and anti-racism as part of our struggle. It is not just an Iranian struggle. This is a worldwide struggle of a multi-headed monster that was created when Ayatollah Khomeini was allowed to land in Tehran by Air France and the Western regimes. Today we are paying the price and the monster has come back to roost. Thank you very much. I would like to ask Bob to come in here and conduct the, the pertinent part of the program. Thank you very much. سلام خسته نباشید سلام میاد سلام هست خوش آمدید قسمت دو برنامه به فارسی را دوست داریم از همه هستن اون تا ما با پیام کانون خاوران و مجموعه نهادهایی که برنامه امروز را ارائه میکنن شروع میکنیم پیام کانون خاوران حقوق بشر و دموکراسی برای ایران تورنتو فدراسیون سراسری پناهندگان ایرانی در تورنتو کمیته مبارزه برای آزادیان زندان آزادی زندانیان سیاسی در تورنتو کمیته همبستگی با مادران جان باختگان در ایران تورنتو کانادا و ندای صلح آزادی به مناسبت 22 سالگرد قتل عام زندانیان سیاسی در ایران دوستان گرفت به برنامه امروز که در 22 سالگرد قتل عام زندانیان سیاسی ایران در تابستان 67 برگزار می شود خوش آمد این پانزده همین برنامه هستش که کانون خاوران یا به تنهایی یا با نهادهای دیگر و جریان های سیاسی دیگر در تورنتو برگزار کرده می که جمهوری اسلامی 
حضور خودش را با اعدام سران رژیم شاه سران و مسئولان رژیم شاه آغاز کرد ولی چندی نگذشت که با اعدام تقی شهران و محمد رضا سعادتی که هر کدوم سالها در رژیم شاه مبارزه کرده بودن برای این شاه گوشه ای از ماهیت ضد مردمی خودش را که به اون سمت و سو حرکت میکرد را نشون داد در ادامهش فرمان حمله خمینی است به کردستان در بهار آزادی در 28 مرداد 58 که صدها تن از مردم مبارزه کردستان را اعدام کرد و بعد اون صحنه اون صحنه معروف تیرباران در فرودگاه سنندج که شلیک و احسن ناهید بود که ایشون را با حالت جراحتی که داشت از بیمارستان آورده بودند و در کنار برادرش در حالت درازکش اعدامش کردند اون صحنه جنایت اعدام در کردستان این نشون میداد که حکومتی که در میاد روی کار حکومتی حال و خونریز است که میره بر علیه بشریت جنایت خودش را ادامه بده سال بعدش در روستاهای قارنا و قلتان یه نصر کشی کرد و همون شب پنجا و نه تن از جوانان مبارز محاباد را در ظرف یک شب اعدام کرد و بعد میرسیم به ترور رهبران مردم ترکمن سهرا توماج مختوم و همینطور رژیم فاشیستی ایران دهه شهست را با قد با اعدام سعید سلطانپور و محسن فاضل شروع کرد دو کمانست و مبارزی که سالها زمان شاه بر علیه رژیم مبارزه کرده بود و سی خرداد شهست با سراغاز جنایت بزرگی بود که رژیم در سی خرداد شهست در تظاهرات های هزاران نفر به میلیونی مردم از بالا مردم را به رگبار و از پایل کوپتر و ده ها نفر را در سی خرداد شهست اعدام کرد با سه سال اول دهه شهست، سالهای شست و یک تا شست و سه شست و چهار روزانه ده ها و صد ها نفر را می دیدم از دوستان و رفقای ما را ما مخفی بودیم ولی روزنامه های رژیم را که می دیدیم اسامی دوستان و رفقا را می دیدیم که ده ها نفر و صد ها نفر به رژیم اعلام می کرد که بعد این منافق بوده، کمونیست بوده، بیدین بوده و اینا را اعلام کرد و همینطور رسید تا به قتل عام هزاران نفر در کمتر از دو ماه در تابستان شهست وقت که امروز بیست و دو بامین سال گردش هست باز قتل های زنجیره ای رو داریم محمد مختاری محمد جعفر پوینده و باز ترور مخالفین و مبارزین و مخالفین رژیم در خارج کشور هیچ کدوم را کم نبود رژیم در نوزه اردی بهشت همین امسال شیرین علمهولی، فرزاد کمانگر، علی حیدریان، فرهاد وکیلی و مهدی اسلامی را اعدام کرد که خودش بازی قتل عامی است در اشل کوچکتر در دو هفته گذشته در زندان وکیل آباد مشهد ده ها نفر و شاید به روایت صد ها نفر را رژیم اعدام کرده و همین الان که این کلمات را میشنوید تعداد زیادی از زندانیان سیاسی زیر اعدام قرار دارند به ویژه 16 نفر از مبارزین سیاسی که اهل کردستان باشند رژیم جمهوری اسلامی از اول روی کار اومدنش شکنجه و زندان و اعدام و قتل و جنایت با اینا شروع کرده و تا سرنگونی کاملش این کار را خواهد کرد 
ولی اگرچه این رژیم با زندان و شکنجه و خون ریزی شروع کرد و حکومت شومش را تا الان روی زندان و شکنجه و اعدام سرپا نگر داشته اما خیزش گسترده اخیر مردم نبیده در یک سال و نیمه گذشته نشون داد که اگرچه سرکوب میتونه در حرکت مردم تأخیر ایجاد بکنه اما نمیتونه اونا از بین ببره و دیدیم که شورش یا انقلاب یا اعتراض سراسری مردم هر چیز میشه بگذارید شروع شد و میره تا کلیت رژیم را به چالش بکشه دوستان رفاق اگر چه زندان و شکنجه و اعدام به عنوان ابزارهای سرکوب جمهوری اسلامی تا سقوط کاملش فرا نرس ادامه خواهد داشت اما اعتراض گسترده ما ها و هم صدای مردم آگاه و مبارز جهان میتونه تعداد بیشتری از زندانیان سیاسی را آزاد بکنه و جلو اعدام خیلی بیشتری را بگیره بیایید متحد و یک پارچه در این مسیر هر چه بیشتر میتونیم گام برد خیلی من. من دوستان حسن پویا روید میکنم قسمت فارسی برنامه رایان دوستان ما به مدد پونزده به بیرون بره وقتی از رایت برمیگردیم قسمت دوم برنامه شکنم فقط خواهش میکنم بیش از پونزده به بیرون بره